Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Story Dive. We're diving into all things storytelling and trying to get our best grasp on the whole realm of storytelling and bringing it to you guys. All of that knowledge, all of that juicy goodness. Uh, I will be the host for today's... Uh, uh, what do you call it? What are we calling this? Today's speak, our, uh, story, speak and... story time... Yeah, uh, our, I'll be the host of today's story time. Oh yeah, <laughs> it makes it sound like I'm part of like in a library, you know, talking to. Kids. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, uh, I'm 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 a little kid right now. I'm sitting on the carpet, and Kai's got a big book, and I'm eating. Uh, gummy, I got a worms. big boy book. I smuggled a bunch of gummy <laughs> worms into class. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> it's in a library too. That's. Oh yeah. Oh. Uh. So. Uh. I didn't even introduce us. Uh, I am Kai, and my co-host here is Logan. Woo! What's up, everybody? What's up, story peeps? It's, it's, you're this kid in the library with, like, up the backwards <laughs> hat, you know, with, like, gummy worms sticking out of his pockets, and he's like, oh, what's yeah. up, everybody? What's up, everybody? Uh, <laughs> crazy, dude. We're, we're making a story about our uh, story, you know? Uh, yeah we're already getting into it yeah so uh for those that are new to this whole podcast uh i will tell you a little bit about the premise essentially what we're going for is we want to explore uh the concept of storytelling what it is why it is how to get into that kind of industry because there's lots of different ways to tell a story so we'll be spending the next 51 weeks including this one uh, exploring different mediums of storytelling, different elements of it, just talking it through with each other and having a good time. So we're grateful to have you join us uh, for this. Uh, as I mentioned before, it is only 52 weeks long. So last week's episode uh, combined with this one, there's only 50 weeks after that. And then it's over. Yeah. And by then we'll be hopefully storytelling experts. And we want you guys along the ride every single step of the way. Yeah, maybe... and I think today's topic can generate some some excitement, some maybe... especially some discussion. Yeah, uh, I hope we can get some uh, some storytelling experts out of this. You know, I hope we can inspire other people to maybe realize that they love stories because that's kind of where I was. I didn't even realize how much I loved storytelling until like the past year or two. I started to think about it. I'm like, wait, I really actually enjoy stories way more than I thought I did. So hopefully we can awaken the love of stories and other people so we can, I don't know, just have a, a bunch of cool stories coming up out of nowhere, you know? Like maybe we're going to inspire the next, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking, I was going to say Twilight, but I'm like, I don't know about that. But uh, The next Twilight? <laughs> maybe the, the next I mean, uh, hey, Harry if Potter? If that's how you make next... your success? Yeah, sure. I mean, at Game of Thrones, highly regarded? I, I don't know. Uh, I don't read a lot of yeah, books. Well, the books... So... <laughs> either way uh as we do want to inspire people to write their stories we want you we want people here to learn just as much as we are learning about yes. like the industry of storytelling uh that does uh as with all things we love stories and i'm grateful that you love stories logan today we're actually going to be talking about what we don't love about stories Ooh. uh it's uh, we kind of want to get into just this fun little topic Everyone has these small pet peeves. If you're a consumer, you know that you have, like, whether you know what they are or not, you know that there are things in stories that just might bother you. Or just, like, rub that itch that you didn't want scratched. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, nails on a chalkboard kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nails on a check for pet peeves with storytelling. So we're going to get into a whole bunch of different pet peeves. Uh uh first of all, uh before we get started, we I did we did talk about this last time. But Logan, I wanted to ask, how are your doubloons doing? My doubloons, bro. I think I like spent them on something. Uh Oh. I don't even remember how many I had. I I may have spent them on like a soda cuz I was kind of thirsty. Nice. But um, soda doubloons. I'm I'm fresh out. Um, 
<laughs> unfortunately. Fresh out of doubloons. <laughs> yeah. Dang it. Well, yeah. hopefully we can get some more today. Uh, yeah, didn't you okay. have some? So, didn't you have some? I had three, but I, I'm giving. I gave them away to the the comment section. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I hope they. You are wonderful today. listeners out there. Yeah, invest. Uh, yeah, you know. Um, uh... Yeah, invest. <laughs> invest them back in us. Make more. Make more doubloons. Yeah, you know. Our, I don't know uh, how, but we'll make it happen. They sell them on eBay or something. They might be worth something. Yeah, there you go. Be a doubloon flipper. Ooh, yeah. You know, I was a doubloon flipper back in the day. Uh, oh, dang. Interesting. Yeah. That's a story <laughs> for another time. That's a story for another time. <laughs> All right. So how this is going to go, uh, I'm going to be... I'll just introduce, like, my first pet peeve that I have. I, we both come up with a small list, and we just kind of want to discuss them. Are they valid pet peeves? Uh, you know, what's our biggest pet peeve that we have? So I'll introduce the first one that I can think of uh, for me. As this is a pet peeve in stories, mostly like in television, but it is across all of storytelling. But it's the concept of like nonchalant death quips. So Interesting. there's always... I kind of have to explain this a bit, but when you're consuming like a, a TV series or like you're watching a TV series uh, and especially like crime TV series, something like Hawaii Five-0 or Psych or like Monk or even probably NCIS and Bones, they probably all have the same concept, but like anime does it, books do it. But it's when someone dies and it's like often later in the show when like the viewer is probably desensitized to death and stuff. The characters seem to desensitize as well. Where like they'll find a dead body in like a fridge or something. And one of the characters will be like, well, I guess I knew where the doctor was chilling out, you know? <laughs> and it it just like changes the beat <laughs> of the whole episode, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? You've seen those I yeah. Moments. I I not a lot come to my mind right away, but I know I know what you're talking about. Um I guess I I cuz I've seen Psych. I don't know if I've seen any of the other ones you've mentioned, but I'm trying to think um you know, cuz I, I I was thinking about like Walking Dead, but I don't think Walking Dead does that. Like Walking Dead actually no, it, it actually does a good job where when people die in that show it's actually pretty serious every time whereas in these other like crime shows it's like they're you, they, you find dead people all the time but because the show's not supposed to be this like dark like super emotional show they like have to make make fun out of it you know they have they, they have to make it lighthearted, right well in a way no. yeah it's, it's like another example while while we're on the concept of psych there's like an i this is where i realize that this is a pet peeve of mine yeah is there's an episode where like they're chasing a ufo uh, it's like a fake ufo or in something and the dude the like spoilers but i mean it's a yeah i mean we're gonna be talking about right a now. lot of different shows and stories on this podcast so uh just yeah but we're <laughs> general a lot of big spoiler, spoiler warning yeah, general yeah. huge uh, spoiler warning uh so with psych the dude like swallows a flash drive and he gets thrown off the roof right and he lands right in front of sean and gus and Sean just sits there and stares at him. And he's like, well, I guess we know where our client went, you know? And it, it's just like, maybe it's for a quick laugh, but I often find myself not really laughing. I just am kind of like, oh, yeah, it, it, it took yeah. the like, horribleness out of it, but I'm not laughing. And then as I start to think about it more, I'm just kind of like, man, that's a horrible thing to say. It's a horrible thing to say in the situation. It's treating it... The, the concept of death is a very serious concept, if you stop to think about it. And treating it so lightly is just so, like... The more I think about it, the more off-putting it gets to me. And I've just been wondering, do you feel the same way with that? I, or is it just kind of... Do you have a different I don't know. I mean, it's, it's complicated, because you're explaining this, this situation in Psych, and I... It's weird because there's mixed feelings, and some could say that this was actually a very realistic response. Now that that because it you know a pet peeve is something that bothers you. It's not necessarily like a flaw, right? So I, I yeah, this is an interesting this is an interesting one that you brought up because especially if you look at Psych and you look at Sean Spencer's character, 
it was very in character for him to make a joke out of something like that. There's a lot of characters in storytelling that when they're faced with something very serious and traumatic, they make a joke. That's a very realistic trait that a lot of people have. They, when you go through something mm. traumatic, you, you tend to make jokes about it. That, that's a way a lot of people cope with it um, is through like humor. And being, and this is another topic that could be, I, I don't know, because I haven't, I haven't been in situations like that too often, but um, like people that are in that line of work, so people that are constantly around like traumatic things and people dying, like imagine people that work at the hospital or EMTs or like policemen or whatever, like they're probably surrounded by death all the time. And I wonder if they would have reacted similarly in that situation as well. Like, I don't know. It could have been more of a realistic response than you would think. Um, yeah. But, yeah. but a... at the same time, I feel like there are some situations in these shows that are unrealistic, that are very much like you should have treated this like with more respect or, you know what I mean? Like the whole, like the, like, you know, the Logan Paul stuff in the woods or whatever. Like there, there was a time and a place to make jokes and i do i do understand what you're saying about it being like either disrespectful or it just it like doesn't click with you like there's that disconnect because you're like i would never say something like that in this situation um right but i yeah. i do think it's interesting to look at maybe the other side of it and being like was it in character uh and do people actually do this in real life this is a realistic thing that is such an interesting perspective i i never really took it that way but yeah that that definitely changes like I don't know if it's a pet peeve of mine, but yes. anymore. You well, might have swayed me. Yeah, and that's interesting. I, I, user for I'm not trying peeve, I'm not trying to like persuade you to like not think that way anymore. I just thought it was interesting to me. That's how I was looking at it. So Right, yeah. But yeah, so, it, that's uh, anyway. <laughs> Do you yeah, have any other examples? Uh, like there might be like an example where it's like oh. uh because I'm trying to think of some like is usually I guess it's just like it's interesting to think about how like in Star Trek I know there's specific characters you have to focus on right right but those darned red shirts just die left and right they're they're essentially fodder yeah you know just like human matter to be expunged from the ship at will but then when a crew member of like importance dies there's usually a scene about it. There's like people crying or like mm. people feeling bad. And, and the, the whole switcheroo around that. So like, okay. Also in psych, if you go into that perspective, um, there's like when, when like non main characters die, it's really like almost taken in stride to kind of a yes. quippy funny. But then, you know, when Mary dies, when they're fighting Yang, or the other, what's his name? Uh, Yid. It's been a long time. I think I know what you're talking about. Yes, like the the season finale. They're like at the movies. Yeah, yeah, and the Mary villains. dies. Okay. It's still, I mean, it's treated with, like, humor, you know, because they're, like, standing in tennis outfits over his, like, casket. But the actual moment of him dying is treated very differently because his character is a bit more important. Or in that same realm, when uh, the two girls, when Sean's like two love interests are in danger, but on separate sides of the city, it's a way different situation. It's so different. Sean is stressed out of his mind. Mm. Everyone's stressed out of their mind. Yes. Trying to save these two characters. And, you know, it's just interesting to think about how, like, it can be handled so lightly and yet also taken so, like, not lightly yes like it's a, it's almost a, it's like inconsistent almost uh with the way the character responds to these situations like because i do know what you mean where because it, it'd be one thing if like every single time something traumatic happened to sean he was making a joke and it seems like he didn't care but it's another thing if like sometimes he actually acts differently because it's like well that doesn't line up um and, you yeah. know like those kind of inconsistencies so maybe, maybe while we're talking about that that inconsistency is what makes the story so interesting is that you can finally tell when Sean is truly like stressed out. So we're saying that your pet peeve is actually like 
a great storytelling is... thing. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we've just converted this pet peeve into oh, like something. Man. Actually yeah, useful. I'm like, this is pretty good. And and something that yeah. I would like to see personally, because not just psych. I just I wish I had more examples off the top of my head, but um, in shows where people make like they they don't they don't react the way they should to uh, traumatic events or people dying. Um, it would be cool if like later on they showed, cause that's, that's, that's something that I think would be a lot more realistic is maybe Sean being like, oh, this is where our flash drive went. But then there's a scene later where he's like, as soon as he finally is alone and he's like in his room by himself, he like starts to kind of break down a little bit, you know, like maybe. Oh, he's, he's like, he is deeply disturbed. Yeah, him. but maybe he is, but he like just doesn't show it to people, right? Like, cause a lot of people do that, even myself. It's like, I like to seem fine. And then later on, it like hits me. Like I, there's like a, almost like a delayed reaction. I, that, that's a very common thing in trauma, I think, where in the moment you're kind of in shock and you, you kind of just keep going. And then like when you finally like have time to process it, that's like when it really hits you. So I think that'd also be interesting if like they kind of like showed Sean later actually like not being okay with it. But I don't know. It's it's very interesting because, you know, again, it's a fun, it's a fun time story uh like very light-hearted crime show it's not supposed to be this super emotional deep thing you know so, mm -hmm. right uh yeah uh and listeners if you have thoughts about any of these like pet peeves and if you have like perspectives that you see it differently or if you agree or if you disagree please let us know i want to open up so much discussion about this stuff because it's so fun to talk about yeah man comment about it comment 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 share share it to your friend get in fights with your friends yeah and like if they give pushback on these pet peeves have them comment to here and we'll open up like a war of pet peeves and stuff yeah, i don't want to condone you, war you, you over got, a podcast but, you, you gotta you know. persuade people that their pet peeves are actually good storytelling aspect yeah yeah exactly exactly <laughs> but just, okay okay yeah. Uh, okay. One well, doubloon for you, sir. Oh you yeah. Know. Oh yeah. I know what I'm doing with this bad boy. <laughs> and with that doubloon, I also am opening up the stage to you, uh, for you to present one of your prepared pet peeves. Okay. So I was thinking about this earlier. Um, pet peeves I feel like are typically like guilty pleasures a little bit, where it's like there's nothing inherently like wrong with it but it bothers me right yeah yeah exactly yeah um and so this one i i this one might not fall into that category as much it's not as it's, it's not as personal but i did want to open it up for discussion because i feel like this is a common pet peeve with everyone on the planet and that is plot armor um and i, <laughs> <laughs> I freaking hate plot armor and i feel like everyone else does but i guess my question is like is plot armor necessary or uh, is there anything you can do to like actually like do it right? Like not have plot armor. Like I feel like there's a need for it. And I guess the, one of the examples I'll give, and this is spoilers for the, uh, the new guardians of the galaxy movie um, is uh, you talking about three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there were a lot of, and I feel like they had fun with it. So, so beyond this point, it's new enough. I'll give a spoiler warning. I'm going to go in depth on it, but, Throughout the whole movie, there's like fake out death for like every character. Um, yeah, yeah like, that's true. I thought every like, which I think ended up being a good thing. But the fact that like uh, this brings up a whole topic with the rest of the Marvel movies, where like for a long time we knew these characters weren't going to die, like main characters. And this this goes for a lot of shows, like a lot of animes, a lot of everything. But like especially because these MCU people had contracts. That's like it's like deep plot armor like we know they're not gonna die because they have a contract and we know that there's gonna be an, an event like a movie next year or whatever you know like you get like that lineup for marvel like two years in advance or whatever and it's like oh there's gonna be iron man three or whatever you know whatever the sequel is and it's like so we know iron man's yeah. not gonna die in the two movies leading up to it like anyway so it's like that whole deal and like how does that detract from the story uh i don't know i i mean i'm we don't have to get into it as a full topic but i'm i'm just mentioning it as a pet peeve i have i freaking hate plot armor and just watching things knowing that like 
this person can't die like they they can't or get removed from the story like like i don't know um like how do you feel about it yeah okay i i can agree plot armor is um it's difficult it's a tough pill to swallow because you're just it takes you so far out of the story um out of the out of the magic of the story because you start to see behind the curtains yes. and you can see all the shields that the writers are putting up for them um but i can offer some perspective on this because i i've thought about this a lot i would say the every main character in the story especially if you want them to live right they have to have well sometimes they will have situations of just plot armor I think the best plot armor is the stuff that you can't see. It's when someone is protected and you're kind of like, oh, yeah, uh, that you, you don't register it as plot armor. But actually, now that I'm talking about this, it kind of feels like, well, if it doesn't look like plot armor, it's probably not. So, well, oh, give me an example. Uh, what, do, what do you mean? So, uh, let's go with Baymax. Baymax, like okay. as we've been talking, for some reason Baymax is like in my mind. <laughs> Dude, I'm down. In Big Hero Six. Uh he like dies essentially, right? Yes. He like doesn't well, he sacrifice he, himself like, at the end. Yeah, and he uses his like robo arm thing to like, shoot off. Like on. Avengers one style, but he actually dies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's basically, yeah. And uh Hero is able to, like, he still has Tadashi's chip because it's, like, in the glove, right? Mm -hmm. And if you stop to think about it for, like, as you're watching it, you're like, thank goodness. Thank goodness he still has Baymax because I know how much he missed it. And thank goodness he still has, like, Tadashi's chip that that Tadashi's legacy can still live on in this world. It all works out for the best, right? But when you stop to think about it, any time they take that chip out of Baymax, he ceases to function, right? Mm. Just completely. So how did he then take the chip out and stick it in his glove without Hero noticing and then shoot him off into, like, but it? I guess that raises more questions because it's like, okay, wait, does Baymax really have a soul or not? It, that's an example of plot armor that's disguised really well. Like, what do you and mean the more by, you like... Explore it, how is that plot armor though? I, I'm I'm having a hard time. That's an excellent question because as yeah. I'm saying it, I'm kind of ending up feeling like, well, it, I guess it's not. So maybe we just can determine that plot armor is terrible when when someone is saved simply because the story needs them to be saved, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I I legit thought that in Guardians Three, Peter Quill was dead at the end, and I I was so mad because I'm like, how could you kill him off in such a weird throwaway way, you know? Yeah, but then yeah. he but then he wasn't dead, and then it's like, oh, he's actually going to be appearing in future Marvel films still, and I'm like, oh, that's sick, you know. Like, it ended up turn they turned the like I feel like Guardians Three is actually a great example of like how to do plot armor right because they like they had fun with it. They almost like made fun of plot armor. They're like, oh, they they're going to die, ridiculous. but they're not. You know, they're going to die. Oh, this is not right. And it's like it actually instead of you know Chris Pratt's. It's a contract being up and having to kill him off. We're actually putting him in more movies. It's like, wait, what? You went against the plot. You like broke, you broke the curse. Like, I don't know what happened. Yeah. Um, Cause I thought that rocket wasn't going to die because rocket and Groot can be played by anybody since they're CG. Um, I thought that they were going to stick around, which there was a minute where I thought rocket was dead as well in the movie. I was like, Oh, fetch. Like he's actually dead. I was going to like cry my eyes out. Um, uh -huh. But then if you look at the other movies, right, like freaking, uh, I guess a good example of bad plot armor would be the new Ant-Man. Like I thought, I oh. thought, I thought Ant-Man was dead. hundred thousand percent. Like he should have been. I'm like, this, Not is, in this a mean is, way. yeah, I'm like, this is where he dies. Like he's had a good run. He's in over his head. He's going to die. And he somehow lived. And it's like, that doesn't make any yeah. sense. That makes zero sense. Wait, like he wait. was so, he was so dead. Like ten thousand percent, you know. So there is hours upon hours of like I would say, let's just have our own like sub podcast on just complaining about like the Marvel movies 
themselves. Uh, I mean, but I, yeah, there's there's, there's like hundreds said. of hours of content on on like YouTube and stuff. Yeah. So uh, anything for me, I have my feelings about those stories, and I totally agree. Like, yeah, Black Widow is another good example of plot armor just going off. Oh my bag. gosh. So. Yeah. It's yeah. a. I can agree. Plot armor okay. is bad. Okay. There's so... not really a way to like. As we've kind of discussed, there's not really a way that I can think of to disguise plot armor to make it okay. Yeah, the, okay. Uh, there are essences but... of, like, where you think they have plot armor, and they don't. Those are the interesting things. Like, uh, yes. examples of that, I would say Attack on Titan really set the tone for that kind of story. Where just, like, it's a, like, nobody is safe kind of story you know yeah, yeah not even that, the main character very quickly on it's weird how that show attack on titan it leads by not having plot armor and then somehow actually has like some of the most plot armor i've ever seen so it's, it's, <laughs> that's true it's, it's, it's so interesting true. It, like, it, it's like the tone and it's then both it... extremes because people do die in that show like like straight up but like a lot of the main characters like just can't die like they just will not like yeah. I don't. I don't know who has more plot armor, Mikasa, Levi, or freaking Aaron. And I'm not. I'm not caught up, by the way. So I don't know what ends up happening. Like, uh, okay. Well, it, it's at, over. At least, the, at the least. Last, uh... Wait, wait. Did the did it actually finish? Like the. Yeah, yeah. The last episode of it came out on the fourth. I actually oh, just watched no it this way. morning. So it's no like way. I I gotta catch up then because I I watched all the way to the end of season three, but like. All the stuff that happens up to that point, like especially because like Aaron dies like three times and he's fine, so it's like what the yeah, catch, yeah, bro? that's true. Um, he is like uh, after death plot armor. He has revival armor. Yeah, dude. Like what the heck? Like like freaking Jason or something. Like yeah, I, I don't know who. I, like I, I just know in the Friday the Thirteenth movies, like Jason, he like always dies in every movie, but he's like always back. Like he, he always comes back. Like. <laughs> It doesn't matter what you do, he'll be back. Uh, like he freaking there's like a movie where Jason goes to like space or something. So like I don't know, it's crazy. Wow. Um, but yeah, plot armor. It, the, the, I guess the interesting thing to me about plot armor is that I feel like it's a bad trait, but it's also necessary. And it, it's you know, of course, you can do it worse than other times, but like if you have a a series where this main character is the main character, like you can't just kill them off, like. You need to like give the the watcher like you need to give them good reasons why the character is okay. Like if the the problem with Plummer is you can't put them into like these unrealistic situations and have them get out solely because like the reasoning can't be solely because they're the main character, right? It can't right. feel yeah. that way. They need to get out for a good reason. They need to survive or get protected for good reasons, you know. Uh, so for I think that, that's what's hard. And I think one of the other things that you can do is, like, you give them a good reason to get out of it by having them have to grow and think around the situation yeah. mm -hmm. and, like, develop as a character in order to overcome the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In its, in its core, I feel like that is exactly what Marvel is missing. Right. Which I feel like that, that, yeah, like, these days, I feel like there's actually... Because it's interesting, because as for as many bad examples as there are, there's probably a good example, too. Because, you know, uh, not to get into Marvel too deep, but, like, you know, uh, all of those movies and IPs and things, like, especially a lot of the MCU movies, they're not all done by the same people. They're not all done by the same directors, same crews, same actors. So it's like, uh, like some movies excel where other movies fall short. So it's, it's, it's interesting, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, well, I'll just say one more thing because I had a thought with that. Yes, yes. Um, I think one of the best ways where they subverted plot armor, and I think this is why um, Infinity War is regarded as one of the best movies ever, is because uh, the audience did have all that expectation, all that plot armor. What What's the point of another Avengers if we just know they're all going to survive anyway? Right. You know, we with we know they have contracts. We know they like have signed on we know who's going to be in the movie thanks to like tom holland spoiling everything uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then you know everyone watches and watches and watches and then they lose at the very end it's like they all lose there's yeah. nothing like yeah. they, and then they're gone and there was no 
Marvel didn't say anything about their are their contact contracts done. They didn't mention a thing about that. They just let people just like stew. And I didn't get to uh the I was like off uh doing a commitment in Hawaii, so I wasn't able to watch the movie uh when it was in theaters, but my family did and they told me that you know as as soon as all the characters started dying like left and right just drop dead silence well i mean of course tears as well right but like mm-hmm. people walked out of that theater just completely silent yes just like absolutely shell shocked because they they had full expectations that the plot armor would save these characters you know mm-hmm. yeah which in the at the end of the day it, plot armor did save those characters but uh <laughs> Right, but I mean, you go back to it; it's all undone by the plot armor. I know, of, uh, time even travel. even though, yeah, even though I love both of those movies, I think Infinity War is regarded as, but from my point of view, most people say that that is the at least the best Avengers movie. Um, and yeah, I yeah. I can agree, but it's interesting how a lot of the high, most highly regarded stories of all time are ones where the people lose. Like the, you know, like it's so interesting. And I think maybe it's because it goes against plot armor and goes against expectations. Maybe it's because it's like more relatable and emotional. I don't know. That's a topic for another day. Uh, yeah. But yeah. It, it is so interesting to me how when the plot armor goes away, it's like, bro, I really like this. This is, this is interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's sad, you know. Um, but yeah. Anyways. Okay. Well. So we've managed to keep that pet peeve as a pet peeve. So Ooh. that's another doubloon in your yes. favor. Yes. <laughs> so we got All right, two, bro. You got to bring one to the table. Doubloon. You got to bring one to the I'm table. I'm working that... on it. I'm working on it. I think I've got a banger with this next <laughs> okay, one. Okay, okay. I'm ready. I'm ready. I think we're going to. Okay. You've definitely heard of the concept zoom and enhance, right? Um, Kind of. I, I don't think I've actually heard okay. it. I think I know what it is. So, I just haven't heard it as a term. Zoom and enhance is like something that's done in like any heist movie. You think Mission Impossible. Think, uh, again, going back to like crime TV shows. It's in that. Anything that has any modern movie with modern technology that has to deal with like cameras and stuff. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, it's even done in animation. It's done in like all kinds of I, stuff. I think it's like going back and, to Marvel. I think it's in like Iron Man a little bit. Oh yeah. Where it's like, oh, it's like Jarvis yes, very much. zoom in on this thing. Yeah. Zoom in yeah. on this. And it, it like punches in and this is going to get kind of nerdy here. Cause it's a bit of a nerdy <laughs> uh, frustration. Well, th- this is a real there pet peeve is, then. This is a real pet peeve of mine. <laughs> yeah. Of when when they're like punching on that guy and the dude is like a, a a centimeter on the camera, right? And it zooms right into that. Well, the way images work, at least right now, is images are a series of pixels. Even in vector art, it's just very specific pixels that operate differently, but it's still pixels. What yeah. you cannot do, especially with camera feeds, is insert more pixels. It's not possible. There's no way in any kind of video or photo editing that you can edit in more pixels. You can't add pixels. And especially if you do, the only thing that it does is add more pixels based off of what you think it is, not what it actually is. So when they zoom in on these characters and they're like, and enhance, and the the image just like depixelizes and it's this like clear image of the person, I end up being like, oh my gosh, that's not possible. It's not. Yeah, like we don't have that kind of technology in existence to make that happen. It's not possible. Right, like you're like you're like it goes against the science of like how this even works in the first place. Yeah, like, yeah, and yeah. that never happens in real life. You never see someone just like zoom in, enhance, and get the exact identity. You just get motion. Yeah, like and and, st- and I I for my job I work at an escape room place and we have cameras there i can tell you i watch those cameras for my job they do not zoom and enhance (laughs) it's not they don't i mean those people are just blobs on the screen you can zoom but you have to have like a specific camera with a specific lens and it has a limit like you can't zoom from like a drone view of a city 
into like some random dude walking on the sidewalk and have it and get like a mug shot yeah, of it. Like there's no there are like and who knows, there might be technology that exists, like satellite views and things, but I can totally see the uh the technological like side of it like really bugging people. So like people that like like you say yourself, like you use cameras every day and uh, you know how this stuff works. So it's like really bothers you um when the it doesn't line up. Which, you know, you know, maybe maybe we can give the the Iron Man's a little bit of slack the the ones that have the increased technology because you know if you well can... right yeah if there's but... if there's like futuristic technology involved i can suspend my disbelief right right but if you're using technology that like i'm supposed to assume that this is available technology in our current world yeah the whole enhanced thing just destroys it for me it's like when uh, this is kind of a on the similar vein I know a lot of people will agree with this one. It's it's a very niche pet peeve, but it's along the same lines where characters don't know how to hold guns or they like have cocked their guns. So there's like a bullet in the chamber, right? Okay. And okay. Then, so wait, wait, are, like, we, are we spreading this pet peeve out into like the, like, uh, what is it? Like misinformation about like how, I like, guess so. Te- te- like, like misuse technology. of technology. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Misuse of technology that we're supposed to assume is like the same as what the current modern world. Right. Is. So like people, people will like cock their gun. Right. Or like a, a bunch of police people or cops or whoever will, or even soldiers will then cock their guns as like they're standing in front of the person and you'll hear all the like you know yeah i I wish i had a sound effect like a soundboard for the for the noise i think i did a good job but either way you know what i'm talking about they they all make the the noise of the cocking the gun and making the the chamber the bullet in the chamber and it's like but realistically you would already have the bullet in the chamber or or like someone cocks their gun and then like five seconds later they cock it again you hear the noise again and it's like wait but yes. a bullet's already in the chamber mm-hmm. it's that exact thing where any gun owner i've talked to lots of gun on gun owners about this exact subject and they're always like oh yeah it drives me up the wall it's an, it's horrible it, yeah. it makes me sad to watch like and believe what you will about gun rights and stuff like that gun lovers really want to see guns properly used in movies properly yes um so this uh it's very similar to a pet peeve i have uh, that that you kind of reminded me of um so i don't think uh just to just to follow up on what you're saying i don't think uh i can sway you on this one i feel like that is a completely fine pet peeve to have it it is frustrating you know um but that kind of goes right into mine if you don't mind uh which is very similar yeah yeah which is when i gotta swipe a doubloon for myself real quick oh yeah oh yeah you're in that one make sure i got one uh my next pet peeve would be uh when people like when there's music and they not like especially in movies and shows right like hyper photorealistic like people playing instruments but they're not actually playing them like i hate that so oh yeah, yeah much yeah. this one's like a real pet peeve i hate it when there's a because you know it's so easy to do uh uh singing because you, you know you can lip sync or do however many shots of sure singing the words but and like, if i see someone playing the drums and it doesn't line up to the actual drums it like bothers the crap out of me or they're playing the piano but like the what their hands are doing is not those aren't the right notes you know it looks yeah, kind of yeah. right you know, a guitar is easy to, but to look at a fake, but like any, I'm sure if I knew how to play guitar and I looked at their fingers, like, that's not right. That's not right. Um, so, yeah. you know, it it really makes you appreciate, like, I think the, uh, Rhapsody, what, what was it called? Not Rhapsody, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, the, uh, the Queen movie. And, uh, even, oh. like, even like Whiplash, which I, I know Whiplash probably has, uh, some of that where it's like not real like what you're hearing and what they're playing isn't like one-to-one but you can tell that they at least like really tried you know i i get that but like there's so many movies where it's like here's the musical number and they are just not actually playing it and i'm like bro it it just it takes me out of the movie 
Like, I, maybe that's just such a small thing because a lot of people don't know how to play instruments. So, like, they're probably fine with it. But, like, it's, well, it's just one of those things, kind of like what you're saying with the technology, where as soon as I know how it actually works, it, like, just takes me out of the immersion. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, okay, this, this, first of all, I can totally agree. It bothers the crap out of me. My wife hates it. It, like, <laughs> makes her so mad. It's so bad. She dude. gets so mad when, so, when someone's not playing it. Um, but uh, on this topic, like, kind of going to what makes some things really good, I'll share some information here. Uh, uh, regarding The Greatest Showman. Yes. Um Zendaya, when she was cast as like the character she was, I haven't watched it in a while. Yeah, I saw it when I it was did learn this new. back then. I thought it was really interesting. Been a minute. I, I actually really like The Greatest Showman. I kind of want to explore that as like a case study. Sure. It was, yeah, it was. I, think it's I liked it. I liked it a lot. Um, some people really hate it, but you know, hey, if you hate it, comments in the yeah. comments below, and we'll start another another feud. Yeah, another uh, war. anyway. <laughs> Yeah, another one. war, war, rage war. Yeah, uh, one day we'll tell the story of the war of uh, of Hugh Jackman and the Greatest Showman in the comments. That'll be the story. Yeah. <laughs> well, so uh, actually, both the things I have to say have randomly something to do with Hugh Jackman. But uh, <laughs> Zendaya, um, when she was cast in that role, she went and took trapeze lessons so that she could do. The trapeze and she practiced for like two i think it was two years two to five years of of training just so that she could do those numbers and be a real performer and do the trapeze and i think this is kind of like a similar vein but a little different just because like that's for your safety you want to know how to do it right yeah um yeah, I would. It would be so scary if you had to do a trapeze stunt and you had no idea. I no, mean, they have real. stunt people, but Zendaya herself trained to do it, and it looks great. I think that's one of the reasons that, like, that song, the song she sings with our boy Zach Efron. Yeah, uh, I forgot he was in that. What's movie. it called? <laughs> Funnily enough, because he's one of the main <laughs> characters. I, yeah, I, yeah, you just like <laughs> unlocked a memory of Zach Efron in my brain. I was like, oh. Bad. Yeah, well, they do all these trapeze stunts, and it's like crazy just to see, like, oh my gosh, Zendaya knows how to do that? I had no idea. And then you start to study, like, yeah, she put in the time and the effort. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a little time and effort goes a long way to know those kinds of things, like yes. the instruments and stuff. Uh, but the other example or kind of note I wanted to share about that if you've ever watched the Les Mes, uh, but like I, the the movie, I have with Hugh Jackman in it. I I've seen I've seen very little, but I I know he was in it, with like Anne Hathaway and yeah. some other actors. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that movie is regarded as like one of the worst musically represented versions of Les Mis ever. Dang, really? Yeah, and the reason for it is because of the. There's like an essence of movie making mixed in with theatrical performance of like a musical that just didn't mix. Those don't mix. When whenever they'd have musical numbers in musicals, I think like nine times out of ten, it's pre-recorded in a studio. At least they're singing and the the, the drums and all that kind of stuff is all pre-recorded in a studio and is edited in, and they're just kind of like half singing while they do the dance number. Yeah, which is kind of what makes musicals on their own so impressive is to be able to dance and sing yeah, at the same time. I yeah, but, so it's almost like the movie was like them lip syncing, but like not even good. Well, so Les Mis, the interesting thing about that is they did try and meld the two together. So like Hugh Jackman on one hand, he's you know he's got the superhero bond. He's yeah, Wolverine. He, he's he's a legend. He's a legend, but to get that kind of body, you have to be on a very specific diet, uh, a very water deprived diet, actually. Yeah, really? like they actually dehydrate a lot of superheroes so that their veins pop out and stuff. It's mm, like a movie yeah. trick. You can you can look it up and, and right. research it uh, mm -hmm. if you're interested, listeners. But um, with that being said, he's so he's on one hand, he's forced to like go on this horrible diet 
and he's also training with like several different uh voice coaches so they no, and none of them have the same clear vision so his voice just didn't seem as trained as it needed to be but then when they're doing when they're filming it the song that they're singing is like on set all of the noise and stuff on the music is on set and that's how a lot of older movies especially like pre CGI editing kind of movies had to do it because there was nothing else. The movie magic was do like the performance yeah. during the thing. Wait, but so in this case, they actually played the music uh, like while yeah. recorded. It wasn't like edited in later. Yes. Dude, that's crazy. Uh, so they're singing. So Hugh Jackman's singing and stuff while it it's decent. The problem with it is he doesn't. He's dehydrated as crap. He's he's the most dehydrated person on the, in the on set because he can't drink any water to keep his body type going. Mm, yeah. And so they're shredding their voices over and over again. And there's so much more I could get into that forever. Yeah. But it brings up this point of like, while you, I guess there's like a, a what's the word, a duality to this what you're saying with the instruments and like just music in general as performed by people in the movie yeah is nine times out of ten it's recorded in a studio but it goes a very long way if you take the time to make it genuine yeah and there's a way you can mix those realms together to make it excellent like the greatest showman so like i guess the tldr of it is les mes is a tough example the greatest showman is a good example of like how yeah. to show genuine care into the craft that you're trying to portray your character doing. Yeah. Cause honestly it's not that hard. And that's the thing that like, I think bugs me the most is it's like, you can do two things, right? If someone's playing the piano, just don't show what their hands are doing unless they're actually playing it. You know, like maybe do shots that are like ambiguous where it's like, you can tell they're playing the instrument you can't really tell what chords they're doing to kind of not break the illusion. But honestly, is you know, it's one thing to tr train for trapeze. That that's hard stuff, right? And like you got to be like perfect or whatever. Like so that stuff's different than like all you got to do cuz literally all you could do, right? Let's say you do a music number, okay? In a in a movie. You got the singer, you got the drummer, you got the like the, the guitarist, right? Let's just keep it simple. Yeah you do shots of like all three of them up close and then you do some like wide shots. Okay. The wide shots, you can't really tell what they're playing. You do up close on the singer. You just lip sync it. Like it wouldn't for, for the single shot that you're doing of either the drummer or the guitarist, you could have them learn what chords to put their fingers on for the guitar and just make that like, how hard is it? Cause like, yeah, it, it's hard to learn a whole song and it's hard to be like proficient at like, instruments that you've never played but it's not hard to like spend a couple hours to just learn maybe maybe even one hour to just learn that one chord so that when they do that close-up shot it's realistic like i just feel like it's not that hard same with the drummer it's like mm. if he's gonna do a drum fill like a doo 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 and then crash them all bang right it's not that hard for him to learn actually how to do that one fill on the drums for that one shot like it's just like acting. It's like Interesting. do do the thing that the music is doing. But I guess the problem is that maybe the people that are directing the movie, like maybe no one on set is musically intuitive. So they not nobody knows. They're like, just make it look like you're playing. I don't know. I mean you see you see it way more in like maybe like sitcoms and T V shows that are like lower budget. Uh, but man, dude, it just, yeah, I, it really bothers me. And it, it's not, it's not really, that hard. You really got on this. This is like a hill you will die on in this situation. It is not and that I, hard. I'm here bro. for it. There's okay. like, we've clearly determined like a, a semi easy fix where like just a bit of genuine, sincere studying <laughs> can go a long way yeah. to eliminate this. this not pet even months, so, like one hour. That's all it takes. Yeah. Or even, even if like you're in a time crunch while while makeup's doing their thing and while like grip and electric are setting up the lights and stuff just have the person practice the uke for a yeah. second mm -hmm. you know like that's what that's yeah, what i would I, do I tell you. if i was an actor so, yeah we, that played an instrument i would do that i would learn that instrument at least a little bit so listeners if you can figure out a way to like 
break this pet peeve. I can't. So I, I think I think it's very founded. And you have a real solution to go with it. So oh, yeah. I think that's a doubloon for you. Bro, dude, I'm at three? Yeah, three dude, doubloons. Crazy. And you're at two. No, no, I'm at one. Oh, I've got, fast, I got one whole doubloony. Oh, man. Well, you, you, uh, but gotta... that brings me to... You gotta... Yeah, I've got this back. this one last. We we have time for about one more uh, pet peeve here, and I think I'll in- introduce it if that's okay with you. If yeah. you have more, we'll have to save it for another time. But this is my my last one. I saved this one for last because it's the one that bothers me the absolute most. This one, like I, this is a hill I will die on. I want this to completely disappear forever from storytelling. And that is stand and watch syndrome. Oh yes, I. I Are you? It, you're familiar with this concept, this is, right? It's a very anime thing, right? I mean, it's in everything, but like, or it's a, a yeah. Actually, yeah, for sure. it's it's a. Well, okay. I, I I guess there's probably multiple layers to this, so I'll let you I'll let you explain what you mean. Okay. So, well, uh, on what you're saying, it is definitely like most egregious in anime. I think they're the worst offenders of this, but it's in everything. And here's here, what I'm talking about: stand and watch syndrome at its core is the act of a character just not doing anything about the situation and just allowing what is happening to happen. And it, it often happens like in some kind of hostage situation or if they're like in danger or if they're just like, there are scenes in like shows and stuff where they're just standing there. Oh no, he's so strong. What are we going to do? And my thought is anything, do anything, uh-huh. but not nothing. Don't just stand there and just stare at what's happening. And it's, I wish I could, there's so many examples that I can't like pinpoint one in in any way, shape, or form. But like, watch any like shonen jump anime, or like just I guess shonen in general does this a lot. Like, watch My Hero Academia, watch Yu Gi Oh, watch Naruto, watch One Piece. They have so many times. You're just like this character could be like we know what their power level is. We know what they can do. They just don't do it. They just sit there and let the person get away with the the hostage. And then later, they're like, we have to get the hostage back. And I end up thinking, well, why didn't you just try and stop them from getting the hostage in the first place? Or it's another another thing that they do. uh, Like, okay, here's another example of kind of stand stand and watch syndrome. They're talking about standing, but it's the same case. Uh, In Incredibles, the the movie Incredibles, Mm -hmm. there's a situation where one of the it's like those blade disc yes hover thingies right and they're like chasing uh what's his name the kid what's dash. the little boy's name the, dash the, the dash. dash they're chasing dash the dash uh they're chasing him and he gets like he somehow lands on one of them i forget how it's been a, a hot second uh but he lands on one of them and he's, they're like punching each other and stuff and dash sees the the cliff that the ship's about to run into right mm-hmm. dash sees it and he like jumps off or he gets hit i can't even I, does he get by a tree i don't know it doesn't matter either way he he come gets off of it the other guy turns around and sees that the cliff is there like he clearly sees it and instead of doing anything he could do literally anything he could pull up on the thing he could even steer it downward if he really wanted to uh-huh. it wouldn't do any good but he could do anything he just sits there and screams and screams until he explodes inevitably. And I end up sitting here being like, well, why didn't you just do anything about that? They do it so often in Star Wars too, where they're like, I can't stop it. And they're like screaming, even though they could, instead of screaming, like veer to the left or right to dodge some fire. I know they get hit eventually. And, you know, sometimes deaths have to happen, but it, it leads to some really, wonky stuff that i'm just like if you just took action in this situation you wouldn't be this wouldn't be a conflict yes now i want to play devil's advocate here see if i can earn another doubloon ah yes all right so 
So I think there is a lot of merit to what you're saying about, you know, it's frustrating to watch uh, somebody kind of like not do anything, especially when like, because like that's what like you're, it's so easy from an outsider's perspective to like be like, you should have done this better, especially like I feel like horror movies is it's huge in horror movies too, where it's like you could have done anything, but you just like died or got got by the guy or you you could you should have just not gone in that house you know or whatever it is um and i feel like i agree but i also know that like in real life like there are a lot of times where i should have done something and i didn't um like there's a lot of times where i find myself in that same situation where i'm kind of just staring at the situation i'm observing it but i'm like I don't have the the balls to actually do it. Um, it I, I I don't have too many big examples of this, uh, but I am thinking about because you know one of your favorite shows, My Hero Academia, is all about people who are capable of getting over that hurdle. So it might be more of a realistic thing in people to kind of be in that like sit and watch syndrome like then you might think it might be more of like a real problem than like a maybe a story flaw so i understand where you're coming from with it and i i will say this if there is reason for them to be standing and not doing something about it like they're having an inner conflict or there if there is a hostage and they don't want to hurt the hostage right i can understand those situations or like what you were saying they have this like inner dilemma where they want to move, but they just can't, right? Those are excellent story beats. I love those because it introduces some sort of inner conflict and like realistic fear in the characters. My problem is when they just stand there and there is no reason for them to just stand there. I see. Or, or like, like, it's almost like a weird thing of plot armor. Like lots of cartoons did it too, where like, the bad guy could have been apprehended, right? But instead, the characters... Like, I was watching the cartoon Teen Titans with my mm -hmm. wife because she had never seen them before. Yeah. And I started to notice it everywhere where I'm like, I know it's a cartoon. I know. It's it's built... It's a TV year seven, right? It's not... As a kid, this was awesome to me. But as as I've gotten older, I've started to notice more and more. It was like, Robin, if you just threw your net now when they're just standing there monologuing mm -hmm. then this wouldn't be yep. a problem yeah why are you just standing there waiting for it to happen monologuing uh, is incredible... a huge huge thing with that sorry i didn't mean to where they just stand and talk at each other yeah for so long for so... and then the, the main bad guy throws like a smoke bomb and magically gets away and you're just like why did you let him throw a smoke bomb why did you let him move if you tell him you're under arrest don't move and then they move and somehow get away because you're just standing there. That's on you. That's your fault. There is no reason for... There's no excuse. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So that that's what I mean by stand and watch syndrome. They're watching something horrible happen. Or, or like, I guess there's times where people can be, like, too stunned to move. Right? But there are some situations in, like, horror films or TV shows or even books and stuff where I just sit there and kind of, like, you guys could move. If you did move, you would dodge whatever's coming at you, you know? Yeah. But yeah. instead, you just stand there and watch it happen. I, I do think monologuing falls into this category a little bit because there's a lot of villain characters that they decide to monologue, and that's what gives the hero enough time to, like, kill them or stop their plan or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And or, like, uh, like they... they... Yeah, it's but that one's a little more realistic because you know a lot of, there's a lot of characters that are uh they like their flaw is that they're overconfident or they underestimated the the heroes or they you know they like to their enjoyment in life as a character is to kind of like be in this egotistical state where they're above them and they want to yeah like, stretch it out their control and flaunt, and yes like that that's a real thing uh which is like way more understandable than the the stand and watch but. At the same time, you know, if you were really like, because some of these mastermind villains, like master mastermind villains, make these stupid mistakes of just 
talking for a little too long. And it's like, uh, like in a way, that's it's a very similar problem uh, where it's yeah, like they're just yeah. standing there, not doing anything. So. On the same note, uh, talking about villains, this is a similar situation of just like not doing what you could be doing. Like actions that you could take, you just don't. Or you choose not to take for no reason. So, like, there's situations where, like, uh, Doctor Doom will have a villain or a hero, like, in chokehold, like, literally choking them out, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And they'll they'll they have them there, and the hero is obviously not able to do anything about this. This actually happens to Spider Man like a lot. <laughs> he's he's placed in these like super chokehold situations, and he's just stuck there, and he can't do anything. Yeah, but he can't escape it, and you can see he's struggling. And then the villain like throws them against the wall, which gives them the exact out that they need to turn the tides. Yes. in the battle. Yeah, I was just which is entirely that. the villain's. <laughs> it's like all it's of their like no. Doctor Octopus will throw them against the wall. I'm like, why didn't you just keep choking? Yeah, I mean, I don't. Of course, know. I want Spider Man to win. Of course, I want Spider Man to win, and I want Doctor Octopus to not win. Right. But by all means, if you have them in this inescapable chokehold, you've won. Yes. So why did you just then give up your lead by throwing them away? Yes, I was playing Miles Morales on PS5. I was playing that the other day, and this this exact thing happened. I, I was fighting the Rhino, and he grabs Miles, and I'm like, bro, like, he's got him. Like, this is it. And then he just throws him. And I'm like, dude, you had it. Like, that was checkmate. And you just let yeah. him go. Yeah. Like, I know exactly what you're talking we, about. But that's like a, thing. That's like a different pet peeve. File that under, do we file that under plot armor? No, no. I, that's not plot armor. That's just, because that could happen to anybody, right? That, that, I feel like that's just like, is it plot armor? Because it's like the villain can't kill him. Right. Well, I guess it can be filed. I would file it under plot armor. Just. Because it, it, it's a little bit, by yeah. all means, the, the only reason that the hero even lives through that situation is because the villain just decides to throw away their entire game plan. And, yeah. And yeah. And do that a, a lot of these villains, it's not like, because, you know, some it could be in, in their nature to, like, maybe there's a villain, but he doesn't like to kill. He, he just wants to fight. You know, like, there, I love those. That, that villain archetype is one of my favorites where it's like, they just love the art of battle, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So it's like, why would I kill him when I could have more fun with him? Very like Tai Lung kind of, but, like but, from Kung Fu Panda, right? But in that in that situation that Rhino was in, I'm like, dude, Rhino hates Spider Man. He's like making his life like a living hell. Like, why would he? Why would he let him live? There, he has no reason. And it's not in character. We've it also doesn't seen help him. him nothing. Chill. Yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a freak. He's a bad dude. So it's like. Yeah, so it's like in those situations where it's like it just doesn't make sense, right? Like, I, yeah, so that is plot armor. Um, but I don't know, dude. I, I mean, going back to the stand of watch, I, I, I can't really argue it other than saying that there is a little bit of relatability. Uh, but I there's feel relatability like when it's condonable. When it's but yes, like, but most of it's not there good. allowing monologuing. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. There's so. there's room for it to be there, but nine times out of ten, I can find excuses for why it should not be there. Yeah. So uh, I don't know, man. I uh, I gotta give you a doubloon for that. You one. know what? I don't know, cause like you bring up some good points, though. I think we should have the listeners decide whether or not I get a doubloon. What? <laughs> when when, like, when is it gonna cash in? I have no idea. A couple episodes from now, when we can get enough data. All right, guys. Well, if, if we you... can get, if we can get, like, we'll put a poll somewhere somehow. <laughs> we'll figure out how to put a poll up, uh, probably on our social media accounts. Um, if you feel that stand and watch syndrome is like a real thing, or is it a justified piece of storytelling, uh, and whether or not you guys believe it in or not. Uh, We'll award a doubloon to either me or Logan. Yeah, you you hear you heard it here. Um, freaking the balloons might be on their way. They might not be. Uh, but you guys be, have to decide. You guys, you guys are actually the 
the, the balloon holder in all actuality. So there can only be one holder of the doubloon, either me or Logan, unless it ties. Then I guess we'll split it. I mean, right now we're both right. Right now we're both holding doubloons, right? Well, sure, but I mean, like, you've got the pot. I've got a singular dime sized oh. doubloon to myself. Man, you really gotta you gotta earn some more doubloons, Kai. I keep taking. I gotta earn some more doubloons. I gotta step it up. And we'll but maybe, maybe next that... time. Yeah, maybe next time I'll earn some doubloons. Uh, that being said, we are going to call it here. Uh, we've really, I've enjoyed talking about our uh, pet peeves. I think it's actually kind of expanded some storytelling skills in like what makes a good story to me. Yeah. And how to immerse uh, a consumer better. I hope, hope that uh, you listeners have also learned something too about this. Uh, and definitely, if you guys have more pet peeves, please, please send them. I would love to have like a, a part two here where we discuss your guys' pet peeves because there's there's got to be some that like neither of us just ever thought about. Yeah, I, I want like the nichest stuff you could think of. Like, I just really hate like when someone's doing gum or something, you know, just something crazy. Yeah, yeah. Bring receipts. Bring receipts for this. Find in the stories where this is and and bring it to our attention and and stuff. Yeah. Uh, ask your friends about it, too. I, this can create so many interesting conversations, just, like, talking about this kind of thing. But with that, uh, we are going to call it here. This has been Story Dive. Next week, we will have Logan be the host uh, I'm not familiar with what the topic is because we decide them on a week to week basis. But as always, the story will continue in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Bye.